are at increased risk of diabetes or have any symptoms of insulin resistance. It really doesn't matter. You know, the beauty of the diet is it's so powerful. It really doesn't matter when you start, you know, as long as you started at some point. You can always reverse chronic disease with a good diet plan. So I want to talk to you more about what I think is an optimal diet from an endocrinologist's perspective. Okay? All right. um, my goal is to finish my presentation in, I think I'm, I've been allotted 45 minutes. I really want to keep 10 minutes for questions. So I'm going to um, ask Mike to let me know, uh, that's good, um, when it's 12.25, okay? So I can All right. So when you think about, is this a good, uh, is this good? Okay, good. When you think about your optimum diet plan, you know, it's going to be different for everyone because we are at a different stage in our inner environment, right? So the first question to ask is, where are you with your metabolic health right now? What fuel are you using at this moment? environment looks like. Once you figure that out, and we'll go over that in detail in the next few slides, it's important to see what are some of the changes you can make to your external environment to promote the healing of your internal environment, right? And then ultimately we're doing all this to clear the communication that our body sends to us. You know, our body sends wonderful signals uh, regarding what it needs at the right time. But a lot of times when we eat foods, especially processed foods, a lot of the signaling mechanism is lost and it's really hard for you to perceive what your body needs. You know, a lot of those signals are lost. And so if you don't know what your body needs, you may not be able to promptly take action. So I think it's important to do all this and ultimately, most important, listen to your own body, your own instinct, and what you feel is right for you. Okay, and, and that may change at different stages, uh, you know, in your health, uh, different stages in life. Uh, and, you know, you may have to keep improvising, but the key is to listen to your body. All right, so question number one, what is your current metabolic health? So essentially what this is asking is currently, what are you using as your energy source? So food is, you know, divided in three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Protein is not used for energy. We, we can't use that for energy as much, but we typically use fat or carbohydrates for energy. And they're both different. They both have their unique properties. And one is better than the other. In my opinion, it is the fat that's better than the other. But the important thing is to see where you are. And to answer this question, you know, so these are some of the questions you can see um, where, you know, how, how it affects you. So do you find yourself crashing frequently? What I mean by this is, do you, you know, do you have to eat something constantly to make sure you're not crashing, you're able to focus? Um, do you feel like you need to crave specific foods all the time, especially carbohydrates? And we'll talk about why that happens. Food and we're not able to burn it off as much uh, because of all the conveniences, you know, of modern day. Um, so it's really up to us to make sure we keep that balance because once we start storing energy, it starts creating problems. And then that's when, you know, a lot of these health problems sort of come in and especially the key health problems that I am most interested in helping people are problems with insulin resistance and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So in order to understand energy and your metabolic health, we really need to figure out how we use energy and how we store energy. Right? So with this two compartment model, and this comes from a, a very good book called The Diabetes Code by Dr. Jason Fung, he talks about we typically save, uh, we typically store energy in two compartments. And he beautifully shows it in this picture. So when we eat food, we first store it in our refrigerator. And then once the refrigerator is full, it's the previous slide, sorry. Here we go, yeah. Uh, and when the refrigerator is full, and if you still are having a lot of excess energy in the form of food, you start storing it in your freezer. And this is a sequential process. 
So the advantage of storing energy in the refrigerator is you have easy access to it, but it is limited storage. So whatever, um, once you've met the storage capacity, you go on to the freezer. The advantage of the freezer is you have unlimited storage capacity in your body to store fat, but you don't have easy access to it. Now, ideally speaking, when you fast, you would like your freezer to be used up first, right? But that doesn't happen. So when you fast, the energy that your body is going to go to is the one that is most easily accessible, which is the refrigerator. And only after your refrigerator is almost empty, once your glycogen stores are almost gone, only then, unfortunately, do you start accessing your freezer. So in, a, so in addition to, let's see, so when we fast, we use energy from glycogen first, refrigerator, and then from body fat, as long as insulin levels are low. So insulin is a very, very important hormone. We know insulin because of what it does to blood sugars, but the primary purpose of insulin is really to make sure we don't die from starvation. So every time we eat, our body will release insulin, and the job of insulin is to store energy for future use when we don't have access to food. So as long as insulin levels are high, insulin will act as a bodyguard and will store energy as much as it can. Which means, even if your glycogen is gone, even if your refrigerator is empty, if your insulin levels are high all the time, you won't be able to access your freezer, which means you will not be able to burn the body fat right around here, right? So it, having chronically high levels of insulin is detrimental for your health. So let's see, yes. So how do we start having high insulin levels? You know, so typically, uh, hormones are very interesting uh, in your body. They're always made episodically. They're, they're made strategically, okay? Because hormones have the effect to, uh, to, you know, ex uh, to exhibit their energy, uh, to their, um, their uh, uh, mechanism to every cell of the body. So if they're on all the time, that may not be a good thing, right? Especially insulin. So typically, especially for a newborn, uh, the newborn's insulin level will go up every time he's breastfed or every time he's fed. But once he's fed, insulin levels will come down and they will be almost zero. And then when he eats again, they're high again. But the problem with us eating frequently and eating a lot of processed carbohydrates is our sugar tends to be high very, very frequently. So when we eat foods that are very high in refined sugar, high in refined carbohydrates, our blood sugar shoots up. And then every time our blood sugar goes up, the only hormone that can bring it down is insulin, right? And so our body has to release insulin. Insulin will definitely bring the blood sugar down, but now insulin is gonna hang out a lot longer and it's going to prevent our body from accessing the fat, right? Because it acts as a police guard. So when blood sugar drops, our body will send signals to our brain and we'll have hunger cravings, we'll have fatigue, we'll constantly crave carbs. And so we end up in this vicious cycle. And this doesn't happen over a day or a week, you know, it happens over years. But the end result of this cycle is we have chronically high levels of insulin. So we no longer have these breaks uh, of not making insulin. And because insulin is present all the time, the problem is you keep storing excess energy and you keep storing it right around here. And then with time, this can increase your risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, so we're talking about unhealthy fat, right? And that unhealthy fat really comes from eating excess energy in the form of mainly processed sugar, processed carbohydrates, and it's stored here and we're not able to burn it out. Does this make sense? Because I want to make sure this makes sense before I proceed. Any questions about this? All right, so really, when we talk about metabolic health, the ideal question is what can we do to start using fat for energy as opposed to carbs? Because the sooner we do that, 
the less likely it is that we're going to store fat in unhealthy areas of our body, and the less likely it is that we are subjecting ourselves to chronic diseases, right? So the two ways to really um, transition from carbs to fat is number one, you know, not to eat at all, right? And that's what intermittent fasting is about. Have all of you heard about intermittent fasting? It's pretty, yes, and I, I practice it myself. Um, and the great thing about time-restricted eating is if you're not going to eat food, you're not going to stimulate insulin, right? And the next best thing is when you do eat food, the 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 strongest stimulus for insulin is going to be carbohydrates, so it really helps to consider eating um, a low-carb diet. So to give you an example about what, what I do, because patients always ask me, what do you do, Dr. Um, I finish eating by dinner. I don't believe in eating anything at bedtime. I think, I think if you're on medications that force you to eat at night, at night especially insulin, or other medicines that cause you to have low blood sugars, it's very important that you talk to your doctor and get those adjusted. So it makes it safe for you to not have to eat constantly, especially carbohydrates. So I don't eat at night. Um, I wake up in the morning. Um, I will have herbal tea or water or broth, and I typically will eat until lunchtime. And so I have my eating window for about six to eight hours, and then the remaining time is my fasting window. The good news with fasting is it doesn't have to be a dry fast. In fact, I would recommend against it. You know, you can do water, you can do a lot of other permitted fasting foods as well. Um, and the great thing is when you have, and, you know, high um, foods with high antioxidant levels, you know, like the herbal teas, you know, hibiscus tea or green tea, um, uh, or if you have broth with spices in it, like turmeric, I, I like to put a lot of turmeric um, in my foods, your gut is like a sponge when you're fasting. So it's going to really absorb a lot of those nutrients right away. So it's good to use your fasting time, if you consider to do intermittent fasting, to also drink healthy uh, beverages that is, you know, that, that have a lot of antioxidants in it. And I talked about what I put in my broth a little bit later. All right, so this is something you can do, you don't have to do it for the rest of your life. You can consider starting here and then, you know, assess where your metabolic health is and then, you know, um, you can uh, modify. So some of the other health benefits I think of low-carb diets, in addition to adapting to fat for energy, is they're very good for weight loss, especially <coughs> here, right here. That's what I'm most interested in. So when I see patients, more than their weight on the scale, I'm always interested in their waist circumference. And my goal is to try to help oh, them yeah. get their waist circumference that's down. Because that's the weight you want to really try to get rid of. And the problem is liposuction will not take care of that. You, know, you really have to burn it off. All right, and then the other benefits of uh, low-carb diets in general is they will try to really deal with insulin resistance at, at, at the core, and any disease that associates with insulin resistance will improve. And, and it's very powerful. It doesn't, you know, it may take years for you to develop insulin resistance, but it's a matter of days or weeks for you to reverse it. I mean, it is, it is just phenomenal. I'll, I'll show you a, a story. So you can really improve or even reverse diabetes, blood pressure, triglycerides, and also non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the other anecdotes I hear from patients is it really improves their inflammation. So a lot of my diabetic patients who were scheduled for, you know, um, hip replacement or knee replacement, oftentimes they don't have to go through that because the pain goes away. They're also starting to lose weight, so, you know, their joints do better. So there's other benefits. And then the other, the key benefit with, you know, eating the right amount of foods, especially the right amount of carbs, is it reestablishes true hunger. So when your blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up and insulin rapidly brings it down, your body's sending signals to your brain to constantly keep eating. You see, and that is not true hunger. That's not hunger based on what your body's needs are for, from an energy standpoint. It's all governed by all that insulin. So it's really important to reestablish true hunger and true satiety. Does that make sense? And a lot of those medications get in the way as well, you know, of true hunger as a type. So it's always good to review those, you know, with your dog. All right, so I want to show you a, a patient story who, who, who did this. So this patient saw me a few months ago, and uh, she's 48 years old. She's had type 2 diabetes for 10 years, and she was on... Um, 175 units of insulin a day, so she was taking 125 units at night and 48 units at dinner.
do different kinds of insulin. And despite doing all this insulin, her sugars were always running high. So, she, so one of the great things with diabetes is we have access to something called continuous glucose monitors, and that checks your sugar all the time. So you really get a good sense of how your body is responding to whatever you're eating, how you're sleeping, your stress levels, your exercise, and a great, great tool to have. Um, it's available prescription, but it is not expensive. Uh, a month supply would be about 50 or $60, you know, and it's, it's really worth it. So if you look at her, she's taking all this insulin, and you see the gray zone right there? So that gray zone is what we call the target zone, which is where we want a person's sugars to be, the diabetes. But as you see, heart tracing is all above the gray zone, right? So it's all high. And on the right, you see those numbers, 185, 255, 218? That's her average sugar for the whole day. So despite taking all this medicine, she's not having any success keeping her sugars down. So, and the other thing is she, the problem by with taking insulin is it'll also wake you into morning, obviously, because it's always making you store more fat, prevents you from burning fat. So she unfortunately had gained 50 pounds in the last three years after starting insulin. And so we talked about the low-carb diet, the plant-based diet, intermittent fasting, everything that I'm talk to, uh, talking to you guys about. And she was really desperate to try something different. So she started this. And then let me show you her. That's her in 24 hours. So she started it on Monday, June 24, in the afternoon. I stopped all her insulin on Monday night, and she was on the intermittent fasting, low-carb diet, mostly plant-based. And look at her. She did really, really well. Within 24 hours, her sugars were down in the low hundreds. And look how steady they are. You know, they're not fluctuating. And when your sugars go like this, you feel like this. And you feel that's normal for you to feel like that. It's not. You know, you can totally change the way you feel by looking at your numbers, by looking, by changing your diet, you know, by using technology to your benefit. It's all available to you. So she had never seen numbers like this since the time she was diagnosed. She was ecstatic. And then the next few weeks, she stayed on this path, you know, and she kept learning. So when, you know, she would experiment with different foods, again, no carb, um, not too many carbs at this stage. And she would see what works, what doesn't work. She um, also worked as a 911 operator, and so she would notice when she's very stressed, her sugars would be higher. Even though be able to use technology to see what are you most susceptible to, because only what you have to do, right, or, or rectify it. She lost four inches and 20 pounds within a month, and uh, she had significantly more. Using fat for energy, it is a very robust source of energy, it's very reliable, it doesn't cause crashes, it's sustainable, and so you feel a lot better. You know, you don't feel like you're up and down, up and down all the time. You feel a lot more steady. And again, you have to try to believe it. You know, I can't tell you a lot about my experience. And she was also able to lower her blood pressure medications as well. So, so she is on this path where she just feels so much better. And she's trying to stay with it because she's feeling so much better. And she calls it the dark days. And she does not want to go back to those, you know. So this is just one story. But this is possible for anybody and everybody, all right? But I think it all starts with looking at where you are from a metabolic standpoint and trying to fix it. So this is the sensor that uh, I was talking about. It's called the Abbott Freestyle 14-Day Continuous Glucose Monitor. It goes on your arm, well, it doesn't hurt. And the, the great thing is you use the reader or you can use your phone to scan it. You don't ever have to prick your fingers ever again. So you know, I tell patients to look at their sugars 20, 30 times a day. They're not pricking. And every time they eat, check your sugar, check in one hour, two hours, three hours, why not? And then just keep learning and become your own, you know, your own expert. And it's really good to experiment with different foods and to see what works and what doesn't. And it's good to keep on doing this because as your body changes, your response to foods, your response to lifestyle will also change. And you'll be able to handle a lot more, but you have to start somewhere. So let's go to plant-based. So any questions about the low-carb, uh, you know, why I think it's, it works and, you know, how, especially if you have insulin resistance. So let's talk about the plant-based diet. Okay, so uh, the great thing about low-carb diets is we have very good evidence short-term that they really do well, give you good results. Don't know a lot about high, you know, about long-term, 
But we have some very good studies long term for plant-based diets. So for me, I like to do the best of both worlds. If I know something is working in the short term and I know about the safety of something in the long term, why not do both? That's what I try to do. Fine. So the, some, of the, some of the things that we know really work with plant-based diets is definitely improves heart disease, cancers, diabetes. You probably saw all this, right, in the video? pressure, obesity, and, and it does make you live longer. But for me, it's always important to live better as you're living longer, so you don't want to live longer just, you know, with tons of medications. And, you know, yes, as Americans, you know, we have increased our uh, lifespan, but we have, we have really lowered our health span. So I think it's important to do both together, right? So this was a, this was a patient, uh, it was published in JAMA uh, uh, by Dean Ornish, and uh, she showed on the left, you see that, that PET scan right there? And you, so the, he put the patient on a plant-based diet for three weeks. And then in three weeks, what we notice is you see the circle back again, right? So the, the flow was established. And then on the right, we're seeing a cor coronary angiogram uh, of a patient. And if you see on the left, uh, the artery is very narrow, right? So he put the patient on a 32-month plant-based diet, and it completely opened without any angioplasty, without any surgery, you know, without any cholesterol medication. So I, I feel, you know, in, in, in um, med school, we've always been taught that you always want to look at big studies. Um, you know, they have to be randomized, blinded. But sometimes, you know, very powerful case reports can also make a difference because, I mean, really, ultimately, what, what the patient cares about is how is it going to impact me? You know, it doesn't matter how it's impacted a thousand people. Yes, we need to learn from it, but it's just as important to look at powerful results, you know, anywhere, wherever we can see them, right? And to see if it, uh, it applies to us. Right. So, uh, you know, when we talk about plan-based, uh, really the question is, why is it that it seems to improve a lot of our long-term problems? So what I have come down to is three reasons, and again, this may have been talked about in the in the movie, so I apologize if it's a movie, but um, I think it's important to address. So our DNA is hit, you know, is damaged really, it has a potential to be damaged by all these hits 800 times an hour, all right? And this is all coming from a variety of um, factors. Uh, but ultimately what they do is they're all causing something called free radicals. So you can get it from UV light, from pollution, smoking is a big one, and another big one that is not on here is stress. So ultimately what happens is all of these things cause our DNA to be damaged from free radicals. And then this is called oxidative stress, and it's just a very fancy word, but what this means is it really impacts everything. You know, from you getting wrinkles, to you getting Alzheimer's, you know, I mean, it, it really affects every body system. So if there's anything we can do to lower oxidative stress and to improve our DNA repair systems, we are really looking at a better health future for ourselves, right? So how can we, you know, improve our DNA repair mechanisms? So how do antioxidants work? So again, this is a little bit technical, but I think it's interesting to kind of, you know, understand why antioxidants work. So typically when um, we, we, typically when we have a stable molecule and if it becomes a free radical, really what's happening is it's losing some of its electrons. And antioxidants are, they have lots of electrons that they can donate to make that unstable free radical stable again, all right? And the important thing with antioxidants is unfortunately it's really found in plant foods. So plant foods contain 64 times more antioxidants and animal foods. So even if you're eating animal foods, it's really important to try to get as much antioxidants as you can because ultimately that will help with the DNA repair mechanisms and will help you in every possible way for your health. The other thing that I find interesting with uh, plant-based diet is its effect on telomeres. So in each cell of our body, we have 46 strands of DNA and they are basically coiled in, in chromosomes. And at the end of the chromosome, there's a tip called a telomere. And as cells divide, that telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter until once the telomere is gone, the cell dies. Right. So if you look at the newborn right there, you see the yellow bar, the horizontal bar? That's the length of the telomere in a baby. As the baby is getting bigger, 
you know, the cells are dividing, and as the cells are dividing, the telomere is shortening. So if you see the elderly adult right there, his telomere is the shortest. So if, if there's anything we can do to limit this, you know, technically we are limiting aging, right? So there is a very important enzyme called telomerase that can help us with this. And it has been shown that consumption of fruits, vegetables, spices has been associated with longer protective telomeres. And refined grains, soda has been linked to shortened telomeres. So I find this pretty fascinating and I think I'm convinced I want to try to keep my telomeres as, you know, you know, prevent them from getting shorter as much as I can. So again, here, spices are very, very important. They tend to have the highest amount of antioxidants. So spice up your food. You know, they, they not only make the, two, the food taste better, but they also make it healthier. And then there is the whole fiber thing, right, that you saw with the prebiotics and the pro probiotics. I don't want to go into details, but I do want to mention that um, the difference. So probiotics are the bacteria themselves, and the prebiotics is what they eat. Okay, so that's the difference. And there are a lot of health benefits of, of prebiotics and postbiotics. You know, our first defense to anything from the outside world is our gut, right? It's completely hollow from our mouth, you know, to our anus. And 80% of your our immune cells are around the gut. So if there's anything we can do to improve our gut microbiome, any you know, anything that is anything that the gut microbiome can prevent from getting into our bodies, I think that's great because then the body doesn't have to deal with the aftermath of it. So I, I'm also a big uh, fiber proponent for that reason. Um, but I also think it, it, it's good to get it from food as much as you can, unless you've had a, a, a gut attack, you know? So if you've, uh, if, you're taking, if you've taken a lot of antibiotics or um, had a really bad intestinal infection, it does help you take some probiotics, you know, for a few weeks. But ultimately the fiber will be a good prebiotic for your gut. For you. All right. so, for me, so this is this is where I'm coming to. So I talked about the benefits of low carb. Talked about the benefits of plant based. So this is my um, prediction. Don't know this for sure, but I think being that both plant based and low carb diets may benefit your health in a similar way, I think it's likely that combining the two would have a positive impact as well. But the key is really to figure out where you are at your metabolic health, right? So if you have insulin resistance, if you have the metabolic syndrome, it would really help you to restrict carbs until you can become metabolically healthy. So what I always try to do is I try to find a common ground across all diets because it's always good to start with less controversy, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about the common foods across, you know, the paleo, the keto, the vegan, uh, what else? Intermittent fasting. These things you can't go wrong starting here because it's confusing to know where to start. Um, especially, uh, you know, if uh, you are surrounded with a lot of information and you have different friends trying different diets and they're trying to convince you to do the same. I think a good starting point is here. So water, number one, you know, we can live without food. We cannot live without water. So you definitely don't want to compromise on water. And the problem is, you know, because we are not listening to our uh, thirst cues, our body sends hunger signals. And honestly, they were indeed, they were really meant for thirst. So it's really important to make sure you get adequate water, definitely 64 ounces a day, okay? And then use the teas. I am a big proponent of uh, drinking anything that has a lot of antioxidants in the fasting period, again, as I mentioned, because you, your chances of absorbing those antioxidants, those phytonutrients, is so much higher when you are having it by itself. So hibiscus tea is a really good one. You know, the WHO sort of looked at, I think, 300 beverages, and hibiscus tea was the one that was at the top for the highest amount of antioxidants, which I was surprised. I really thought it would be green tea or oolong tea, but it was hibiscus tea. I don't like it uh, warm. Uh, it is very bitter for me, so I like it cold. It really tastes like fruit punch. I like to add lemon to my hibiscus tea because anytime you add lemon to anything, it's going to increase the antioxidant absorption. Uh, that's why, you know, when you slice a fruit and it turns brown, you know that the oxidation has started, but then you put lemon juice on it, you can really delay the, you know, the oxidation. So I like to add lemon slices to my tea. Uh, mint is another thing I add. 
And a good sweetener that I recommend is stevia. Liquid stevia is what I prefer because you can really control the amount as opposed to the packets. Um, you can also grow your own stevia. It really grows like basil um, and it's delicious. You can put that in there. Um, and another one I really like is long fruit extract. But I'm not a big fan of Splenda, Aspartame, you know, Sweet and Low, any of those. Um, coffee is another one that also tends to have a lot of high antioxidants. The thing with caffeinated products is it will interfere with your sleep. So I would recommend not to have it for seven hours before bedtime. Okay, so, so use your you know, fasting period, if you decide to do fasting, to really optimize you know, your beverage intake in, in addition to water and just experiment and see what you like and what you don't. Uh, another common food across both diets is greens. Really, there is no controversy about this. <coughs> greens are the healthiest uh, you know, foods on the planet. They have fiber, potassium, a um, lot of uh, phytonutrients. <coughs> there are different ways in which you can eat your greens. You can eat them raw, you can eat them cooked, um, you can put them in your smoothies. Um, I recommend two to four cups a day, personally. Non-starchy vegetables, again, no controversy here. You know, mushrooms, peppers, onion, garlic, ginger, eggplant, um, really anything besides potatoes, and I think you're going to be fine. And you know, you can really make them yummy. You, know, you can have them steamed, you can have them roasted, you can have them um, uh, what's the one? sauteed. It really, really doesn't matter as long as you're, you're eating them. I do believe in adding some fat when you're eating your vegetables because a lot of uh, nutrients tend to be fat soluble, which means if you don't have fat, a lot of those nutrients will not get absorbed. So I, I like to saute my vegetables in a lot of olive oil um, um, or, or butter. Nuts is another one that is common across uh, both diets. So there was a study that showed that if you eat a quarter cup of nuts a day, you can increase your lifespan by two years. I think that's great, and it didn't matter what else you did. Um, and nuts are just so delicious, right? So great, great snack. The ideal nut is a walnut, but really any nut is fine. I would recommend a variety of nuts. Um, and what I like to do is I like to make, um, um, you know, I, I get all my nuts from Costco, and I, I make uh, packets over the weekend, and I just take one with me. Um, they're delicious. Peanuts is not a nut. Peanut is a legume. So you can have it, but you won't have the same benefit. Um, seeds, especially flax seeds. So if there is one food that you want to start adding in your diet from today, just one, I would recommend it would be flax seeds. Flax seeds um, lower blood pressure. They improve your lipid profile. So they not only lower the bad cholesterol, they also raise your good cholesterol, which I think is awesome. Um, they have a lot of fiber. Uh, Ten minutes? Yes. Um, and uh, they also have lignans. They also improve your, you know, your, uh, they, they lower your risk of getting hormonal cancers. And again, I can't go over in details, I apologize. Spices, big one, I really recommend turmeric to everybody, a quarter teaspoon a day. And berries, half a cup of berries. Again, um, you can have it across any diet. So really, you cannot go wrong with any of those six foods right there. And then changing the external environment is much more effective than relying on willpower. And this is because we also know across all diets, there are some foods you really want to avoid. And the best way to avoid them is to not have them in your house. Right? I mean, you don't have to avoid it from your life, but just avoid it from your house. If your kids are driving you crazy or your husband's driving you crazy on a hard day of work, you're going to go to those foods in your pantry. That's just going to happen because we use for common foods that are good across all diets. That's a good place to start. Uh, the next question you want to ask is, where am I in my metabolic health? So the best way to answer this is check your waist circumference. So get a, get a thread, and then measure your waist circumference and then measure your height. And your goal is to keep your waist circumference at less than half your height. So if you are 60 inches, you want your waist to be 30 inches or less. Right? So if your weight circumference is more than half your height, my, in my in my opinion, that should be your number one. You know, that should be your number one goal is to try to reduce it. And really, the best way to reduce it is by what we talked about. And there are other ways in which you can test it. Your doctor can test it too. Um, 
So really, let me just sum up here. Try to add spices, greens, flax seeds to your common recipes. Avoid the starch whenever possible. Cauliflower rice is delicious. Cauliflower hash is delicious. And it's a great substitute for rice and for potatoes. Again, two of your very high starchy foods. So, you know, experiment and see, see what you like. Uh, and then when you do eat your carbs, you make them count, like the berries, the legumes, the intact whole grains. I'm not a big fan of whole grain flour. So like whole wheat bread or whole wheat pasta, better to have you know, the actual grain in the form of oats or quinoa. The, the intact grain is where you're gonna get uh, a lot more benefit. And skipping a meal, like we talked about with intermittent fasting, will, will help you as well. And then when you do eat your carbs, especially if you're on insulin, you have insulin resistance, you want to try to limit it until you know you can handle it better. Try using that continuous glucometer. That, that will also answer a lot of your questions. All right, so, oh, supplements. This one slide, because a lady here asked, right, about supplements that I recommend to all my patients. All right, this is what I recommend to all my patients. Vitamin D, 1,000 units. Again, it's important to have it after a fatty meal because vitamin D is fat soluble. So don't have it on an empty stomach. You are not going to get a whole lot from it. B12. Uh, 25 micrograms a day. Again, and the, the great thing with B12 is it's water soluble. So if you have too much of it, it's not a big deal. You just pee it out. Right? So there is no upper limit for B12. A teaspoon of nutritional yeast is what I recommend to all my diabetic patients because it can really improve your immune. So it can give a boost to your immune system. It is a great source of B12. It's a great plant-based source of complete protein. Quarter teaspoon of turmeric. Uh, lots and lots of studies showing the health benefits of turmeric, which unfortunately I can go over right now. A tablespoon of ground flax, and for all my diabetics, I recommend a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar because it has been shown to lower insulin resistance. Um, and what I do is, in order to get all of this, I just have vegetable broth, which is what I had today at 10 o'clock. Um, I get it, I put um, butter, a uh, quarter teaspoon of turmeric. Every time I do turmeric, I add some black pepper because it potentiates the turmeric. I put flaxseed, uh, ground flaxseed powder, I put my nutritional yeast, and I enjoy it. And then after I have it, I do about five minutes of meditation or deep breathing. And this is important because in our body, we have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. We really want to activate the parasympathetic as much as possible. And we're just not doing that as much. So why not take five minutes and just do it, just activate it? Because that is where true healing happens in your body when you are, when you are resting. All right, so finally, um, I have a website, which is not up yet. It will be in the next 10 days. And I have put a class, a four-week online class that sort of goes over everything we talked about. But the key is, really, knowledge is nothing unless you put it in practice. So in my class, my goal is to really give weekly assignments to people to be able to put whatever we do in practice in bite-sized pieces. Right, so I'm going to end here. So, sorry if I didn't wait. amount of antioxidants for any spice and you can really chew on that as well and it really has a similar effect and you may notice it really helps with your hunger as well. Are you accepting new patients? Yes. <laughs> Sure. So you know, you look at your schedule and see what works. 
All right, so most of us are either hungry a lot in the morning or in the evening. So if you're somebody who can just get by with coffee or tea or water in the morning, the best thing would be do is, you know, finish eating at dinner and then try to go start at 12 hours and then gradually make your way up to about 16 hours. And the longer, the better. Exactly. Good, that's a good starting point to work to. 16, 8. So, you know, 8 hours of eating and 16 hours of fasting. loving this. Um, so I was uh, been ketogenic for about a year and doing intermittent fasting and just loving it. I'm about three months pregnant now and a few weeks into it, absolutely couldn't eat that way and we wake up in the middle of the night hungry and I'm finding it hard to find any information on a guide like researching kind of what's the best way to adapt like that because I'm, I'm definitely not using fat for full. I'm, I'm back on carbs because I'm nauseous if I live that way, which I was so happy before. So I don't know if you could share anything on how to adapt to pre for pregnancy because I know it's healthy, but it's not working out for me when I'm pregnant. So, you know, this is where you listen to your body and its cues. It really needs this carbs right now, you know? So go for it. You know, go for the healthier carbs, you know, the, the unprocessed carbs, you know, with, with the entire grains, um, the, the fruit the vegetables, the greens, and then once you once you deliver your baby, you know, you can go back to what you were doing, right? Because right now, you know, your baby's a parasite, you know, it's gonna need more energy. So you're going you actually are probably deficient in energy, so your body is wanting easy, accessible energy, which is gonna come from carbohydrates. You know? And just be at peace with it. at the end. Um, I wanted to start by, that's me, Dilip Barman. Um, if you email me, you can find me, dilip.info. If you email me, I'd be happy to send you the copy of my slides so that you'll have them for reference. Mike, this isn't working. So while we're waiting for the first slide, the first thing I wanted to talk about is a lot of times you'll hear the phrase whole food plant-based diet, and I want to define that for you. How many of you guys have heard the word, the phrase whole food plant-based diet? So it's a common word, right? So there's some controversy. Some people use the word vegan. Some people use the word whole food plant-based diet. So let's make sure our terms are clear. So basically, there's a, is it working now? Oh, my objectives, Mike, is there a laser pointer on here? Okay. My objectives in the next 40 minutes or so with you is to talk about why people might be interested in vegetarianism. There's lots of reasons, and we'll talk about a few of them. We'll talk about some definitions and some misperceptions about vegetarianism. It wouldn't be any fun to give a talk and not give you some ideas from the kitchen, so I love to cook. How many of you guys have been over for dinner in my house? You guys have? Nobody else? <laughs> What, what are you waiting for? <laughs> so, I love to cook, and I, I've been teaching cooking for a long time, so I'm going to give you some ideas. Maybe if some of what I talk about rings true, you might say, well, okay, that sounds good, but now I'm home. What do I do in my kitchen? So I'm going to give you some concrete ideas, and then I'll end with some references. So, um, of course, some of you came in late, but I'm really proud of my film. It's the first film I've ever made called Code Blue. So Code Blue explores this idea of how come doctors don't know about nutrition when nutrition is extremely powerful for preventing, managing, sometimes reversing disease. And I'm really excited about the life we have of Code Blue. There's a lot of great things that I think is going to happen with getting it out to the world. How many of you guys were here for the screening of it? Some of you guys, okay, good. So let's talk about a whole food plant-based diet. There's a number of different people who talk about whole food plant-based diets. I'm a, a Food for Life instructor through a group called Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Raise your hand if you've heard of PCRM. Yay, it's a great organization. Um, and I'm, I'm just delighted that, that I'm part of the organization. We have a focus on fruits, whole grains, legumes, and vegetables. No animal products, which means no eggs, no honey, no milk products, 
no chickens, no cows. Um, and we focus on no more than 10% fat calories. So in my classes, I show people how to cook without oil. We, uh, you don't need oil for cooking or sauteing. And one thing that I like to say to my students is we do recommend 10% fat calories. There's other credible people who recommend even higher, 12, maybe 15, but everybody has a limit. And what I like to say is, do you like chocolate? Raise your hand if you like chocolate. Okay. I love chocolate. Chocolate is, is, has fat. And so if you are targeting whether it's 10% or 12% or 15% fat, I'd rather eat chocolate than olive oil. <laughs> it's a misnomer. Olive oil is not a health food. There was a study done in Crete, and they found that people had pretty good health outcomes. And guess what? The health study was funded by the olive oil companies. So one of the takeaways was use olive oil. It's good for you. Well, there were further studies, and they said, well, not by, by the olive oil uh, companies. And it said, what if we look at what the people in Crete do? They move around, they're active. We're not generally in this country. So activity was an important part of it. And they created a diet, they looked at the Mediterranean diet without olive oil, and they found far better health outcomes. So don't start adding olive oil to your food because you're thinking of moving towards a plant-based diet. You can easily eat a plant-based diet with zero added fat, zero extra olive oil. Um, and our approach is eat all you want. If it's plant-based and it's high fiber, Again, we're recommending 40 grams of fiber a day, which I mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about code blue, <coughs> which most Americans get maybe 10 grams of fiber. Um, I work in the schools and I tell the kids why you want to have a high fiber diet. The reason is that no matter what kind of diet you're eating, even if it's organic and it's great food, we live in a polluted world and you have stuff in your gut that you want to get rid of. So why keep it in? Why not have a high fiber diet? And what fiber will do is it will glam onto these things and and make you go to the bathroom. I'd rather go to the bathroom than keep it in me, right? So get rid of it. So high fiber diet's important. And if you eat that way, we have lots of evidence that shows that with high carbohydrate, low fat, plant-based high fiber diet, you can eat as much as you want, you won't gain weight. In fact, you'll come to an ideal weight. Other people, I'm gonna skip ahead, Forks Over Knives. How many of you guys have seen the film, Forks Over Knives? A great film. Forks Over Knives has a very similar approach. Kaiser Permanente, which is primarily on the West Coast, they have a pamphlet called Healthy Living, which they give out in their waiting rooms, which talks about low-fat, plant-based diet, high carbohydrate, and they get lots of great results. They share it with their patients. John McDougall, very similar. Uh, he's the highest of the high carbohydrate recommenders. He is big on potatoes and high starch, and he's had great results with that as well. So he talks about whole food, plant-based. Nutritarians talk about nutrient-dense food. But let's, let's bring it, and Dean Ornish, of course. Ornish is the, so heart disease is endemic in our society. Dean Ornish, you guys all probably know about him. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Dean Ornish. So he's come up with the only way proven over and over to reverse heart disease, not just stop it, but to reverse it. And he has something like an 84% efficacy rate, which no medicine comes anywhere near. His approach is a low-fat, plant-based diet with moderate exercise. Does anybody know what the third thing is that he recommends? If you're religious, you'll be very happy to hear this. My wife's an atheist. <laughs> if you're religious, you'll be really happy to hear this. The third thing is prayer. And if you're an atheist like my wife, or you're not interested in religion, then meditation or centering. Those three things, you've got to do all three. So centering, meditation, prayer, uh, plant-based eating, and moderate exercise will reverse heart disease in the majority, vast majority of cases. So let me summarize that, that, oops, my definition of whole food plant-based diet is a focus on whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits. I'm not sure, Mike, what's happening with the clicker. Uh-oh, that's not good. <laughs> so whole food plant-based diet basically is a focus on uh, what we call the power plate, so legumes, vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Uh, and then eating food in as natural a way as possible. So there's, uh, all of a sudden there's a lot of people who are really interested in veganism. Many of them are interested from an ethical point of view and that's great, but we wanna recommend to make sure that whether you're, you're vegan for ethics, the environment is by far the best thing you can do for the environment, 
be healthy. You can be an unhealthy vegan if you're eating a lot of processed foods, and there are a lot of these foods available in the store. I buy some of them, but I eat them in moderation, or, or not, you know, very rarely. For example, there's vegan cheeses, there's vegan sausages, there's vegan fish, and I'm glad we have those products. The, what's the burger called? Um, Impossible a, Burger. Impossible Burger, and there's another one too. My wife invested in it and made some money. She doesn't eat it, but she invested in it. So it's good these products are available, but I wouldn't rely on them. I think they're great transition foods. I think if you're used to eating regular hot dogs or regular hamburgers, you'll see a world of difference moving to the plant-based one, but don't rely on that. Rely on more foods that look like the way they were meant by, by nature. So that's the, that's the basics of what I mean by whole food plant-based eating. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah? With the common sense rule and make sense? So, Mike, if the clicker doesn't work, you may have to click slide by slide for me. So, let, let's, no, let's go back. We have to go back from here. So, the first section of my talk is going to be about health. I'm going to give you some background on health benefits of plant-based eating. And while the slide's coming up, I want to mention that... I wanted to mention that you're going to find there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there and you're going to find people who talk about high meat diets, low meat diets, no dairy diets, including dairy in your diet. So I would encourage you to look at credible sources. I'm going to give you a slide a little bit later on which gives you some credible sources and look at the preponderance of evidence. There are papers out there that talk about eating meat, but then look at who's funding the research, the beef industry perhaps and look at their footnotes. They'll have maybe two or three references. That they found a study here and there which recommended under certain circumstances that maybe they found meat was of some benefit. Mike, you're going through the hidden slides now. So if you can just go through the... Let's see. These are... Okay. So what I would ask you to do is to look at the evidence. I'm going to give you some good websites to look at the evidence. The, the nice thing is... In terms of whole food plant-based eating, there's a lot of coalescing in this space. There's a lot of people, including Nelson Campbell's dad, who's just arrived in the audience. Hello, he's our next speaker, I think. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who are talking about a whole food plant-based diet, and they have different spins on it. Some people say 10% fat calories, some people say 12%, some say 15, some say no nuts, some say include nuts, some say include a small handful of nuts a day. But the nice thing is they all agree on whole food plant-based. Generally, the thing that, that differs is the amount of fat. So maybe I need, needn't rely on my slides because I can't get the next slide up. <laughs> While we're waiting for the slides, uh, Nelson's arrival reminds me of his wonderful dad, Colin Campbell, in the China study. Raise your hand if you've read or are familiar with the China study. So one thing that's really interesting about the China study
Now, I always like people to use common sense, and there's some common sense missing there because cow's milk is full of calcium, isn't it? Sure, but the thing is, it's not readily bioavailable. We're not sure scientifically why. There's a couple theories. But what tends to happen is the body sees, wow, you've drunk all this milk. There's so much protein and so much calcium. Don't you know you're going to hurt your kidneys? And so what the body ends up doing is it excretes it and it starts etching it from your bones. So you end up with a net negative, both of calcium and protein. So drinking cow's milk is not a good idea. And there's a lot of references that I will share with you about that. So whole food plant-based does mean plant-based, not milk or meat-based. So I think we're back on track here. The American, you know, what's really interesting is how many of you guys, I know there's some really young people here, and this might be disillusioning news for you, but did you know that money plays a role in government policy? So when the government tells us things, they pay attention to who gives them money. And unfortunately, the meat and dairy industries are huge, and they give a lot of money to the government. And they tell the government, please use this money and promote things through the USDA. So for the, the fact that the government makes statements about plant-based eating, I think is very powerful. American, uh, the AND, Academy of Nutri Nutrition and Dietetics, used to be called the American Dietetic Association, for a number of years now has been saying that um, a plant-based diet, a vegan diet, is certainly something that you can follow. And over the years, they revise this every five years, they're now saying that there's a lot of evidence that it might be the healthiest diet. We know in the plant-based community that it is the healthiest diet, but for the government to say that it may be the healthiest diet says something when they get a lot of money from the meat and dairy industry. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead. One thing which is surprising is there's a stronger mortality correlation. In other words, you're more likely to die by too much fat than by smoking and to get cancer. And in this country, we've done a great job telling people, please don't smoke. And when I travel internationally, one thing that I notice is people smoke more, right? So Ali, you live in Europe now. Don't you notice when you're in Europe, there's more smokers, right? So Europe's a great place, but that's one of the downsides. So one thing that's great about this country is there's less smoking, but it turns out if you had a choice of smoking or eating meat, you're better off smoking in terms of health outcomes. I don't recommend either for sure. But we don't do as good a job in this country telling people about plant-based diets. So fiber I've talked about, longevity. So there's been a lot of studies. How many of you guys know about the Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventists? They're a Christian group that takes their Sabbath on Saturday and they take the Garden of Eden diet very seriously. I'm not Christian, but it goes something like God gave us seeds, nuts, and fruits to eat, or something of that nature, right? And then it was later in the Bible, kind of, um, 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 that, okay, if you can't follow it, then, then you can start eating animals. But it'd be better if you could go back to the Garden of Eden diet, and the, and the Adventists take that diet seriously. And about half of all Adventists are vegetarians, so they're a great group to study in epidemiological studies. And they have some really huge studies that consistently they're vegan eight years longer. I like the idea of living longer, but more importantly than living longer is living longer with quality. Who wants to have the last few years of your life in decline? Nobody does. We want to live a full life. Have you guys seen that quote, I want to uh, die young, but at an older age? And so with longevity, people who are plant-based, when they do die, they tend not to have complications of diabetes, cancer, and other debilitating diseases. Bone disease and dairy, fracture rates are higher for those drinking milk. So if you want to weaken your bones, one of the best things to do is to drink cow's milk. And it's very frustrating because the government puts all these billboards up, you know, with milk mustaches, and the evidence is exactly the opposite. There was an interesting lawsuit among African Americans. African Americans are even more intolerant of cow's milk than non-African Americans. And they sued the government and they said, look, you are promoting milk. My people, African Americans, can't consume it. And you're causing increased disease in my community. This is a modern form of racism. They won the lawsuit, but the government still does what it does. They gave them some money. They said, let's settle out of court. Here's some money. We're gonna keep doing what we do. Um, Mike, I think we're stuck again. 
Okay, um, I've already uh, referred to this study about weight gain, um, child and infant health. The best thing you can do when you're pregnant, when you're raising children, is to be fully plant-based. So, how many of you guys know Benjamin Spock? He made the famous book about raising children. And so, in his last edition, he said you should never introduce cow's milk to a child. But if you feel, for whatever reason, you want them to have milk, give them a chance. Let them be, I think he was recommending 18 months or something, to build up some resistance, and then introduce what he would call a poison. But he recommended no milk whatsoever. Um, Frank Oski, who used to be the director of pediatrics at Hopkins, said there's no reason to drink cow's milk at any time. We should all stop. And then, I don't know how this is going to work because I have to go through these slides kind of quickly, but let's look at Japan. Um, diabetes used to be very, very low in Japan. Prior to 1980, it was less than 5%. By 1990, it reached 11 to 12%, and it keeps growing. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it goes with the increasing fat intake, so the Japanese, as well as many people in the world, are trying to emulate the good old USFA. But uh, their carbohydrate rates have been falling, and, and uh, they've been having increased disease uh, incidence. Uh, and you can see this in terms of overweight and obesity is going up with BMI. So, these next few charts are really interesting. In 1994, if you look at these charts are from the Center for Diseases Control, CDC. And this shows where diabetes is highest. And if you look at the darkest colors, that's where diabetes is highest. So if you look at the deep south, Louisiana and Alabama, it probably won't surprise us that there's high rates of diabetes. By 1995, more blue in the chart. By 1996, even more blue. By 1997, look at all the diabetes there. By 1998, even, Calif even California, right? Even California. By 1999, look at the South, it's solid blue. I'm not talking politics, by the way, I'm talking diabetes. <laughs> by 2000, more blue. By 2001, and then what the CDC finally did, because there was so much diabetes in this country, is they switched to a county by county level, and they switched colors to red to be, to be equal, red and blue, and it just keeps growing. That's pretty alarming, isn't that? If you look at those maps, they just get more and more saturated with diabetes. The frustrating thing about this, too, is that the group I work with, Physicians Committee, we go to the American Diabetes Association conference every year, and they have a recommended way of treating diabetes. It's their diet, which is a limited carbohydrate diet and uh, portion control. It turns out we've had numerous studies, and we've shown that Eat lots of carbohydrates, don't portion control, eat as much as you want, high fiber, we get far better results with A1C. I didn't say we get the same results, we get far better results. And so finally, a couple years ago, the American Diabetes Association, in a footnote on their, in their reference material, saying, this is a diet we recommend, but if you want to follow a vegan diet, you can do it, but they don't say you get better results. So it's kind of a footnote, you can do it. So we're, we're lobbying them, we're telling them, please, on your website, be honest. Tell people if you're serious about diabetes and reducing your A1C, which is a measurement in the blood that tells you, you know, how much you, you, you may have diabetes, then go vegan. And um, how many of you guys saw the film, um, oh, what was it called? What the Health? Okay. What the Health is a good film. It could be better because sometimes they're not as careful with looking at the evidence. But one thing that's interesting, do you guys remember the scene where they visit the American Diabetes Association? So if you haven't seen the film, they go to the American Diabetes Association and they talk to their scientist. And he's happy to talk and he's discussing what they do. And then the filmmaker says, have you considered talking about a plant-based diet? It's a fair question. You know, if the researcher feels there's problems with the plant-based diet, the right response is, I've considered it doesn't work for these reasons. But does anybody remember what he did instead? He killed the interview. He said, end of story, get out of my office. And he yelled at the guy. He said, I'm not talking to you anymore. It's like a bad word. You can't say plant-based diet. Why? We don't know. But it turns out the American Diabetes Association gets a lot of its funding from the meat and dairy industry. Could there be a connection? I don't know. We have a lot of science behind us that says go vegan and diabetes is liable to go away. So, 
here's more information about from the Adventist studies the, that shows about how if you're vegan, you have a far less chance. Uh, you have a 2.9% prevalence of diabetes. That's pretty good. Okay, let me jump ahead. There was, uh, there's, there's so many studies. There was a recent study in India, the Indian diabetes study. So if you're looking at India, it's not a good model because in India, there are a lot of vegetarians, but they use high fat and they're very focused on dairy and that's the problem. So in my own family, all the time we get calls from India, such and such has died and they've been lifelong vegetarians. They had heart disease. My mom died of a stroke. And when we were at Duke, they said, they looked at all the blockage, they said, did your mom use a lot of dairy? I said, yes. And they said, no surprise. So there was a nice Indian diabetes studies. Diabetes is an epidemic in India, not just in this country. And here's a bunch of references. Like I said earlier, when you hear people talking about health and diet, make sure you look at their references. And I, as I said, please email me. I'll send you my slide deck and, and, and you, you can find some of my references here. Okay. Another big problem is portion size. So be careful. A lot of us like to eat out. I enjoy eating out. But in America, they give us huge portion sizes. So watch your portion size. There's different techniques you can do. Don't go hungry when you go to a restaurant. Maybe cut it in half. Yeah, I was just telling you guys earlier about a restaurant. I like Sage. I love Sage Vegetarian Restaurant. One of their dishes is really, really rich. So my wife and I always go there, and up front, we decide to share the main course. It's just too rich for us. So strategies like that may be helpful. It's less of an issue with whole food plant-based eating because the fiber is self-limiting, so you're less likely to overeat. And then this, uh, the people at the University of Alabama have been telling us for years that eating a southern diet is, there's a lot of good things about the south, but the foods that are eaten in the south are not one of the good things. So, um, so you can see that in the south we're at a 56% higher uh, risk of heart disease, 50% chance higher risk of death in uh, with patients with kidney disease, and 30% chance higher risk of stroke. So I highly recommend the film Forks Over Knives. It's an excellent film. I can't recommend it enough. Um, it examines the profound claim that most, if not all, of the so-called diseases of affluence that afflict us can be controlled or even reversed by rejecting our present menu of animal-based and processed foods. Highly recommended. The really cool thing about this is the two researchers um, Nelson, um, sorry, um, Colin Campbell and Caldwell Esselstein, neither of them was even vegetarian when they started this project back in the 50s or 60s looking at diets, and they both came to the same conclusion independently. A lot of other films, of course, my Code Blue film, which we showed earlier today, What the Health I've Talked About. How many of you guys have seen Game Changers? Wasn't that amazing? I have a few... Uh, I have a few reservations about it. I wish that it were a little less man-focused, and I wish the language were cleaned up a little bit. But otherwise, I thought it was a powerful film. So it's now available, I think, on Netflix, and I recommend you show folks. So some people will say, cool, you guys are talking about plant-based eating. That's nice, but I'm a bodybuilder. I'm a professional football player. I'm a high, you know, a long-distance bicyclist. That doesn't apply to me. It turns out a lot of people who are at the top of the game athletically are becoming vegan and becoming far better at what they're doing. So from that point of view, I do recommend the film. If you have children, there are a few scenes you may want to edit out, so watch it in advance, but it's a powerful film. Um, Veducated is a great film. Vegu How many of you guys have seen Veducated? Veducated is, shows that we have addiction in this society big time. So there was this um, challenge. I will give you, what was it, $1,000 if you become vegan for three weeks or something like that. It turns out plant-based eating is, exists in pretty much all the cultures, but not, you know, in ethnic foods, but not so much in this country. And so they talked to um, European descended white Americans, and they said, no, 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 I can't do it. They talked to black Americans, no, 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 I can't do it. They talked to Latinos, I can do that. I know about tortillas, I know about beans, I can do it. They talked about Indian Americans, I can do it. So anyhow, they gave, uh, they, they picked, I think it was a half dozen people, they gave them $1,000, and they checked their metrics. What was their blood like, what, what kinds of, how likely, what was it they were going to get diabetes and so forth before their vegan experiment and after and it was great. Everything came out very well in terms of their health outcomes. Highly recommend that. I love Soul Food Junkies. This film isn't so well known. Has anybody heard of Soul Food Junkies? Soul Food Junkies is told from an African-American perspective, and the argument goes that before slavery in Africa, the diet was pretty good. 
one of one of millions of things that was done terribly to when they when people were enslaved is they were given the worst of foods. And today, if you look at African American diets. This film would argue it's not our fault as African Americans, but it's what the culture has done to us. It's modern racism, and we've got to we've got to not do this. So this African American gentleman who is vegan goes around to family gatherings where they're eating non-vegan food, and he's trying to tell them, you know, if you just give this food up, you're going to find far far better health out there. So I highly recommend that film. Kyle Spearsy talks about the environment. The Last Pig is a beautiful film. Uh, I know the filmmaker, Allison Argo, and it talks about a, a person who farms pigs, and he realizes a lot of compassion. He, he looks into the pig's eyes. Pigs are a lot smarter than dogs. And he says, I can't do this anymore. So he stops raising pigs, and, and I think he becomes a vegan right after the film. And there's a number of other ones. The ones that I've mentioned in the bottom are all more ethically based. How many of you guys have seen Earthlings? Okay. I've never seen Earthlings. I never want to see Earthlings. It's apparently gut-wrenching and extremely sad. But for those of us who are still eating animals, it may be worth watching because it talks about this from an ethical point of view. And I think after seeing this film, people um, may give a second thought about you know, killing animals and eating them. So it's, it's an ethical film that's very powerful. Those of you, raise your hand again if you've seen Earthlings. Do you agree that it has a profound effect on you after you've seen it? I've heard that from, from people many other films. Okay, so keep looking, keeping up with nutrition research. There's a lot of great um, information. You might see an article. Check it out. Go to PubMed. PubMed is... I have 10 minutes? 10 minutes? Thank you. So PubMed is freely searchable. So if somebody says eating lots of meat is good for you, go to PubMed. Read the article. You may not have a medical background, but look at the beginning, the abstract. Look at who's funding that research and look at the summary. Um, look at books and websites by more and more nutritionist doctors, people like Brenda Davis, Neil Bernard, Michael Clapper, Colin Campbell, Paul Esselstein, Dean Ornish, John McDougall, Garth Davis, Joel Kahn, Neil Cooper, Joel Furman, Sue Havala Hobbs, and on and on. There's so many people, incredible people, who have books, who have films coming out, who have written medical literature, and when you look at what they have to say, look at their references. They are extensive. So there's a lot of great places you can go. PCRM, where I teach classes through, um, I recommend you connect with us. The Vegetarian Society has much of the literature that PCRM puts out. I teach Food for Life classes. That's the website where you can find out about the classes. We have like five Food for Life instructors in this area. Um, we have a Food for Life instructor in London too, by the way. <laughs> um, if you're a doctor, you can get CME credits nutritioncme.org. A lot of what we have is free, so you can go out and get some credits. We have a wonderful conference every year. Um, we have been selling out. We get a thousand people uh, in, the, in the conference room in Washington. We have lots of great speakers. I encourage you to come. Uh, Vegetarian Resource Group in Baltimore has a magazine. If you're a member of my group, Triangle Vegetarian Society. How many of you guys are members of TVS, Triangle Vegetarian Society? So you get a free subscription to the VRG Journal. Food for Life. Michael Greger is awesome. How many of you guys know about Nutrition Facts and Michael Greger? So we're tight on time, but all I'll say is nutritionfacts.org is excellent. He has two books, and uh, he, he decided he said most people don't have medical backgrounds, and there's so much information coming out about the benefits of plant-based eating that most people don't understand. So he said, I'm going to review every single uh, work in the medical literature about nutrition written in English and write it up so that even Dilip can understand it who doesn't have a medical degree. And he makes entertaining videos. So I highly recommend Michael Greger. His website is extensive now. If you're interested in pineapple and omega-3s, if you're interested in B12, anything, go there and do a search and you'll find he has a lot to say about it, all evidence-based. Um, tons of topics. Trying to get to the next slide. That's Michael Greger. Michael Greger is coming to Raleigh. I think uh, you guys are bringing him here for a talk. And I think he's coming twice in the next year. Highly recommend Michael. I better jump ahead. Eating plant-based is by far the best thing you can do for the environment, bar nothing. It's by far. 
and I finally understood the final piece of it for me. I homeschool my daughter, so in fifth grade, we were talking about food chains and food webs. And I've always known the statistic that when you eat plants, you save 80% of the energy. And it makes sense because if we were plants, we would spread our leaves and we would photosynthesize and we would get the energy from the sun. But now through a news help and her research, <laughs> I understand that every step, whether you are, uh, when you're a producer, even the plants are only producing 10% of what they're getting from the sun. And then the first level consumers, the herbivores, are only getting 10% of what the plants are generating. And then when you eat people who eat those animals, only getting 10% of their energy. So at every stage, you are losing 90% of the energy that came from the sun. And therefore, by definition, eating low on the food chain is by far the best thing you can do for the environment because you don't need as many resources to grow your food if you just eat the, the plants. And there's all sorts of really interesting numbers here. Rainforest biodiversity, there's so many great things in the Brazilian rainforest, and we're cutting trees down so that we can have cows to graze and then we can kill them and make beef. It's, it's a terrible uh, problem. I'm sure, Nelson, you're going to be talking about that in your talk. So global warming, meat and milk production generates more greenhouse gas emissions than transportation. So in my mind, you cannot be an environmentalist if you're not a vegan. So the first step in becoming an environmentalist is to be plant-based. And there's lots of information I'm going to just have to skip through it. So I want to get to my kitchen. That's my wife and daughter when she was much younger. Um, and I don't have time to talk about this, but if you email me, I'll send you my, um, my slides. I knew I had a lot more than I had time to cover, but I want to get to my kitchen, so let's go a little further. Get your butts off my blanket. Oops. Mike, <laughs> presentation back up. Let me just talk about, so one other reason to be plant-based is ethics. So if you're interested in religion, my friend Rin Berry has a book called Food for the Gods, which talks about many of the world's major religions, Protestantism, Catholicism, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, and he shows in each chapter, he has two parts. The first part he talks about when the uh, religion began, why it was very consistent and promoted veganism. He talks about how he feels Jesus was a vegan, for example, and he gives biblical evidence, right? And then the second part of the book, uh, chapter of each religion, he talks about modern proponents. So if you're interested in religion, I recommend Food for the Gods. And if you're not religious, there's a lot of people who are talking about the ethics of, if we don't have to kill animals, why do it? Why not plants? So the last part of my talk really is about what to do in the kitchen. And I have a bunch of ideas for you guys. How many of you guys have pressure cookers, like an Instant Pot? An Instant Pot can make you a great chef. All you have to do is chop some vegetables, throw them in the Instant Pot, maybe some tofu, turn it on for zero or one minute. How many of you guys know the zero minute trick for pressure cooking? Zero minutes means just come up to pressure and then turn off, and that's all you need to soften carrots, for example. So pressure cookers are great. They're very, very fast. Um, um, I like to cook without oil, and without oil, it's good to have a high-quality pan, a stainless pan. I use pans by a company called Salad Master, which are really thick. They're stainless and titanium. And all I do is I throw my onions in, I put my pan on medium, and then it starts sizzling with no oil. And then I add spices, turmeric, cumin, uh, garlic, potatoes, and I cover it. It creates a convection. No oil, no water. Water dilutes the nutrients too. And I get waterless cooking. So waterless is another good way to go. How many of you guys have air fryers? I never, oil, I never fried food in my life until I bought my air fryer. And I love the air fryer. Um, I can put in potatoes go into the fry mode, and I'll have french fries with no oil a few minutes later. I take, one thing I like to do is I like to take tofu, I dredge it with some nutritional yeast, maybe some salt, maybe some lemon pepper, and, uh, and I put it in the air fryer for four minutes at 450 degrees. I have crispy fried tofu with no oil, no added fat. Um, I wish I could show you more slides, but I think I'm pretty close to the end of my time. The last thing I did want to say is, how many of you guys have been to my Thanksgiving? Great. It's the country's biggest vegetarian Thanksgiving, all vegan. We've been doing it for like 24, 25 years. Tickets went on sale yesterday at 11 a.m. They close at 11 a.m. tomorrow. We used to sell out in less than two minutes, and it's not fair. What if you drop your credit card, you go to pick it up, 
and you're out. So now we have a lottery, so you can make reservations at any time. Tomorrow after 11, we're going to draw a number and we're going to start filling seats. I invite all of you guys to enter our lottery and come to our Thanksgiving. It's glorious. Uh, it's uh, something like two dozen main courses and at least two or three dozen desserts. And it's all 100% vegan, plant-based. Um, we have a number of dishes that are no added fat. If you want to be 100% no added fat, or if you want to on that day enjoy a little bit higher fat, you can. We also have a pre-Thanksgiving, the Monday before Thanksgiving. So trianglevegsociety.org. We have a table there with information about that. Please come to Thanksgiving. And if you can't come, watch for us. We're on the evening news usually. Let me stop there. Do I have five minutes for questions? Uh, I think we're at I don't. Five. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess somebody's going to be introducing Nelson. Sorry I don't have any more time for questions. Sorry I ran out of time. But thanks for your attention. <laughs> what Dillip said about his Thanksgiving meal. So if you haven't done that, uh, go to his website and uh, sign up for it. And also, I just want to give a shout out to Mike Young. He's the, the guy here. In the so this is what I'm going to talk about today. My inspiration for this idea of plant-based nutrition actually comes from my father, uh, Dr. Colin Campbell. And he is the scientist who did much of the research to validate the health benefits of a plant-based diet. We did, we did not grow up plant-based, but I still remember the day when he came in to our house that evening. We always had a big family and we sat together around a big dinner table. And he said, you know what? He said, I have figured out how to turn cancer cells on and off just by toggling between plant and animal protein. Animal protein feeds cancer. Animal protein is the primary cause of cancer. A plant-based diet can prevent cancer, and increasingly there's evidence that it can reverse some cancers. So it's a powerful idea. Uh, he published over 300 peer-reviewed papers. He did a big research project in China and wrote two landmark books. If you don't know about them, I check them out. The China Study and his book, Whole. Now, my father has a particular view of health, which is that the human body is an infinitely complex system. It's beyond our ability to fully comprehend. Every cell is a universe unto itself. And we have trillions and trillions of cells in our body, and they're all communicating and talking to one another. And it's just beyond our ability to understand. But if we take a holistic view in the way that we look at this, we can see patterns. And that's what he did in his research. He was able to figure out that a whole food plant-based diet is what is optimal for the human body. And if we consume a whole food plant-based diet, our body knows how to attain health. And in fact, if the body is sick, it knows how to regain health. Now, we've made a lot of progress the last few years in getting this message out because of grassroots people and activities like Mike Young in this veg fest here in Dillip. A lot of folks out on the front lines promoting this message. But we still have a long ways to go. 
because our health system has not yet embraced this idea. And so, of course, we are blessed to be near Duke, one of the world's leading healthcare institutions. And it's very advanced in many ways. A lot of fancy technologies. Here's a patient rapid transit monorail train to shuttle patients around. But unfortunately, the local health system here is like the health system everywhere. It's based on a very simplistic view of health in the human body. We tend to look at the human body as a machine, a machine that we can understand, tinker with, and adjust. And the way that we do that primarily is through drugs. Now, Mike, uh, Mike, I have to uh, access the internet here, so I'm not sure. Uh, could you go back there and click? Yeah, on this slide here. Actually, uh, I tell you what, Mike, I'm going to save some. I just realized here because I don't have control of this, it's going to be a little bit difficult. What I wanted to do, I'll just walk you through it. What I wanted to show here is you might have seen this drug commercial that's playing right now for Entresto. This is a drug that's intended to, in a marginal way, help to prevent heart failure. Okay? There's only one way to really prevent heart failure. It's by changing what you eat. But if you watch the drug commercial, like so many drug commercials out there, it doesn't say anything about diet. And in fact, what I wanted to show you here on this website, if you go to the website for Entresto, there's a patient testimonial video there. Play it. In fact, at the beginning, in, in the header to the video, it talks and maybe a moderate amount of exercise, and then most of all, Entresto, that prevents heart failure. And that's not true. How many, how many of you have heard the phrase, when you're watching TV and you're seeing those drug commercials come up, when diet and lifestyle is not enough? How many of you heard that phrase? They say that over and over again when diet and lifestyle are not enough. And they're saying that to diminish diet and lifestyle so that you will take their drug. So this is kind of the paradigm of Western medicine. And then to make matters worse, we have medical associations out there who are promoting this paradigm. This paradigm of the body being like a machine and something that we can tinker with and adjust and modify through drugs and other technologies. This is the American Heart Association YouTube channel. Take a look at all of these recipes that they put up here. Italian sausage stew, vegetable turkey soup, I have a hard time here. Curry beef stew, chicken, chicken, cheese steak, Philly cheese steak. This is the American Heart Association. And the other thing that really bothers me, and I, I decided to put this slide in here coming up, because I was at home this morning and I was watching the news, and I saw a story about the... I think it was a big walk or march or something for cancer prevention uh, here in the Triangle area somewhere. And it reminded me of an event that my wife Kim and I had a chance to see when we were on tour for the release of our film, Plant Pure Nation. We were in Indianapolis. And it was the Breast Cancer Awareness Pink Ribbon Thing, and there were thousands of people in Indianapolis. And I guess this event here locally was uh, a similar type event. But it, the story here is really troublesome because P 
people want to help. They want to do the right thing. Many families have been affected by cancer. And people by nature want to reach out and help one another. So all of these good-hearted folks participate in these events. But none of them understand that the real cure to cancer is the food that we eat. And it's because the drug companies aren't communicating this. And so I get kind of upset when I see this. And so when we were in Indianapolis, we uh, went to this event. We had our iPhone. We took some, uh, we filmed a bit of it. And we made this little video. And Mike is going to hit the play button here. You gotta go back. This is, so if you scroll down, you'll see the play button. Now go back to where the screen is black. Now if you if you scroll down the cursor, it'll, it'll, you'll see the play button. Uh, okay, uh, go back again. Let me. <coughs> means as well, which is the development of drugs for the most part. In the 1970s, my dad did research in the laboratory. He found that the chemical that was most effective at turning on cancer cells is the protein in milk. It's called casein. He said in all of his years of research, he never saw something more effective at turning on cancer than the, the protein in milk. So it's interesting that in this uh, uh, event here, this breast cancer awareness event, that they're actually promoting milk at the finish line of the race that we're gonna run today. They're cooking up, cooking up a bunch of meat. You can get meat there. You can get your picture taken. Over here, you can get a cup of milk. And also there's yogurt uh, as well, if you want yogurt. And yogurt, another milk product with plenty of cases. These folks have no idea about the power of between plant-based nutrition and cancer. And it's so sad because all of these people here are trying
trying to do the right thing. These are good-hearted people trying to do the right thing. And what we've got to do in the plant-based nutrition community is we've got to mobilize people like this. So the model here for these events is to raise money for pharmaceutical research. That money then creates new product candidates for the pharmaceutical companies. So the pharma so it's no secret that the pharmaceutical companies are behind uh, a lot of this. So as I said there, I think we need a grassroots movement to promote this message of health, of uh, plant-based nutrition. Because it's not going to come from here. I mean, even in the current presidential campaign, I am waiting for someone to utter the words plant-based diet. And instead, all of the conversation is about how we're going to pay for all the trillions of dollars of health care costs. But there's no discussion about how to reduce the demand for health care so that we can bring the cost down. So this is what we need, is we need a grassroots movement powered by people, people like you. So what I'd like to do now is to explain to you what we have done to get ready for this grassroots movement strategy that we're going to be launching here. So I'm going to go back and give you a little bit of history of our organization. How many of you have seen Plant Pure Nation in our film? Okay, so quite a few of you. Some of you haven't. Um, normally, uh, if there are quite a few people who haven't seen it, I'll play the trailer. So maybe I'll go ahead and see if this works. I just discovered I can control this with, oh. Hey, Mike. Uh, somehow we went to the, if you could uh, put it back on the slideshow and play the uh, trailer. What's your healthiest meal? What? What's, do you have any health meals? Anything is fresh? No, we don't. The culture in America is that everything revolves around food and unhealthy food. The health care cost trajectory is out of control because the consumers are not in charge. This is clearly an unsustainable trend. We're not telling people how to use food. Red meat, Beef. green beans with bacon and butter. When we talk about this idea of plant-based nutrition, it's a powerful concept, and it's one that my father is associated with. Dr. Colin Campbell, Doc. Whole Foods plant-based diet. Right. But you don't mean the store. You know, I went on essentially a plant-based diet. No dairy, no meat. Type 2 diabetes. Heart disease. Hypertension. Gone. Physicians don't know how to prescribe a diet. We've been taught how to write prescriptions. Right now, this information isn't available to them. So how can they make a decision? We're working our way into the political process here. The absence of meat as part of your diet is not the best direction for all Kentuckians. you got to realize that there's a lot of big money interest. In but the amendment itself is flat out true. We're trying to demonstrate this concept in this community. We offered 10 days of food. I've been testing for 26 years, and I've never seen results like this. Mr. Speaker, I call for a vote. The folks that are challenging this, they represent big business. Well, the truth is a stubborn thing. It doesn't go away. The documentary, Plant Pure Nation, explores scientific evidence. In any movement, the first step is always the hardest. Total cholesterol is 150. Is that accurate? Yep. When people learn about this, the very next question they have, why haven't I heard this before? Why? Because revolutions can't start without awareness. 
back when I started in this, there were three farmers markets, now there's about 26. The amount of money that we spend to create the kind of health situation we have is not working. This is going to be a lifestyle. Yeah. Our thesis is that we've got to change this world from the bottom up. So, <clears throat> we released the film in 2015 in theaters in over 100 cities. Uh, then it went uh, on Netflix, and now it's on Amazon Prime and YouTube. We had a call to action at the end of the film for people to join local support groups that we call pods. Uh, the ideas were planting seeds in local community. We had a lot of people answer that call to action. Today we have over 500 pods and well over 250,000 people who are involved. We're actually approaching 300,000 people. That pod network is now supported by Plant Pure Communities, which is a nonprofit organization that we started. In addition to that, after the film came out, we launched the Plant Pure business. There are certain elements of this movement strategy that we had to do through this business, and that includes an extensive line of frozen entrees. We have one of the largest lines on the market, and we're getting into multiple supermarket chains. We also have a line of meal starter products that we're going to be introducing after the holidays. These are dry packs of dried ingredients. You can add one or two wet ingredients and some produce and quickly prepare a delicious meal. We have a seminar program that was created by the producer of Forks Over Knives in our film. We're also going to be rolling that out after the holidays as well. And we have a social action platform, a web-based social action platform that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Much of what we've done is based on food. And so this here is my wife, Kim Campbell. I want to introduce her. She's sitting right over here because she was instrumental in helping to develop a lot of our food products. She's been cooking this way for, gosh, uh, 30, 30 years now. And she has two cookbooks that um, are highly regarded. Uh, and if you haven't tried them, you can get these on Amazon. Excellent cookbooks. Something I'm very proud of is our philanthropic mission behind all of this. We are going to commit half of our future operating profits to nonprofit organizations who are engaged in our grassroots movement strategy. Also, those meal starter products that I mentioned, that was, those products were created as a result of a project that we're involved in in New York City with an organization called Somos Community Care. This is a mostly Medicaid population. We figure out how can we create products that are affordable to people in those communities. And so we came up with this idea because we figured out that we could mass produce these products at very low cost. And what we're going to do is when we're supplying into low-income communities, we're going to work with our pod groups to establish non-retail points of distribution so there's no retail markup. And then we're going to waive 100% of our profit markup. These products will be the least expensive, the most affordable way for people to eat in those communities. And our goal is for people to be able to make a pound of food for a buck fifty or less, certainly no more than two dollars. Okay, so I mentioned that we have this web-based social action platform. We've been pro pro programming this for the past couple of years. We have over 80,000 lines of code in here. And this will be at opentribe.com. And so I will play a short video here, which is on the website to introduce you to the platform. Can you play that, Mike? My name is Nelson Campbell. Thank you for joining Open Tribe. Our mission is to empower people to solve problems in their communities. We provide social networking functionality 
project ideas and resources. And we encourage our users to share their innovations. We are launching this platform through our Plant Pure Planet campaign, focused on promoting the health and environmental benefits of a plant-based diet. This diet can not only prevent disease, but also reverse serious conditions like heart disease and type 2 diabetes, and it can help to heal our planet. When we eat plants, we free land from animal agriculture, which can then regenerate, cleansing our waterways and creating habitat for the other species who have an equal right to this planet. These new forests also can draw down large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere into the trees and other vegetation in the surrounding soil. This campaign is guided by a bold vision, but grounded in humility, recognizing that people must be free to walk their own paths as they change what they eat. When you use Open Tribe, please know that we share the minimal information you provide with no one. We do not support ourselves through targeted advertising, but instead from the sales of our nourishing Plant Pure Food products. We also are committed to sharing 50% of the operating income from these food sales with nonprofit organizations making innovative change in their communities. We believe it is time we come together to begin healing our world. One person, one family, and one community at a time. Okay, so let me talk real quickly about the platform. Um, this is just version 1.0. Uh, we're not actually going to go public with this version. Version We have a second version coming. Um, but just to hit a couple high points, we're going to be able to stream media through here, and we're going to be doing a whole lot of media so that we can educate and inspire the groups of people, like our pod groups around the country who are utilizing this. And here, I think, is the most value-added part of it. We have these projects that we are creating with partners, with national partners. Each project will have a defined strategy for action that groups can undertake in their communities. There will be resources loaded in to support those projects. So one project is our seminar program to roll that out in communities across the country. Another is to advocate for healthy meals at schools and hospitals. The other one is what I was referring to when I talked about our meal starter line. It's a strategy to bring those products and information education into underserved areas. Another project is encouraging physicians to use food as medicine. We have a reforestation project and others. The idea is to give groups at the local level access to simple, well laid out strategies for action supported by resources. And here is a video. Every project has a little video. So here's a little video on our project to, to work in underserved neighborhoods. We invite you to join with us in our boldest campaign to bring healing to where it's needed most, in our underserved communities. Many people think health is a right granted through the expensive drugs and procedures of our healthcare system. But studies prove we optimize our health through a whole foods plant-based diet. Health is a condition we can create through the power of our food choices. This is an especially empowering message within low-income communities because the system has failed to serve their interests. This project is focused on communicating the message of plant-based nutrition in these neighborhoods and then distributing through non-retail channels low-cost plant-based foods from the Plant Pure Foods business. Plant Pure has developed a line of meal starter products that can be distributed through locations like nonprofit organizations, physician clinics, and churches. 
Most importantly, Plant Pure is making these products available in low-income communities at affordable prices by waiving all of its profit margin. Access to the truth of health and to products that can sustain our health is a human right. We hope you can join us in this effort to build a plant-based world, leaving no one behind. Okay, what's exciting about this is, again, this idea emerged out of this program that we're launching in New York City with Somos Community Care. It's a physician network, over 2,500 physicians serving over a million people in four of the five boroughs of New York. All of them are on the Medicaid program. So once we go into production with these products, that's the first place we're gonna go, is we are gonna saturate New York City with these products. And people are gonna use them because they can heal themselves and it'll be the most affordable way to eat. So, <clears throat> I'm hitting a lot of high points here, our food, our education, our pod network, our social platform. These are all elements of a larger campaign that we're going to be launching next year. And so literally what we're going to do, and I'm trying to convince my wife Kim to come with me, she, she doesn't like to travel, but i um, literally going to get in a car and go from city to city where we have a lot of grassroots support and I'm going to deliver a presentation to introduce people to these ideas and to our platform, our social action platform, because everything that we've created is embedded within that platform. So introduce them to the platform and encourage people to start pods or join pods and start taking action in their communities. So this is going to happen next year. As we do that, we're going to use media to drive public awareness of this. Um, I have come to understand the power of media in terms of inspiring people and moving people to action. So we have a film crew, and we're going to be doing a number of things. One is, and we're already starting to do this, um, we're going to do a continual stream of short videos focusing on stories of people who are doing amazing things in their communities. So people who are doing things that could inspire other people to do the same. We also are going to start a webinar slash podcast show. It'll probably be a bi-weekly show and also again focusing as much as possible on stories. We have a culinary show, so this is what Kim is involved in. And we've already done 12 of these. We have 12 in the can. But these are beautiful uh, cooking shows, teaching people how to, to eat this way, uh, how to make delicious meals. And we'll be re releasing these probably once every, what are we saying, once a week. Once a week. And these are beautifully produced shows, like... TV Food Network uh, quality show. We also are involved in a feature film. We have an Oscar winning writer now, he's actually a famous writer, who is writing a script for a motion picture on my father's life. And this will probably be produced and released within the next couple years, but we already have interest from production companies like Participant Media, for example. So we're very excited about this. And then we have, uh, and we've already been filming for this, we have a, a docu-series concept, a series of episodes that will document this unfolding campaign that we're launching. And we have a storyline for this that begins and ends in a trailer park in a tra Cajun community in southeast Louisiana. Um, we're going to need a little bit more money to, to do this particular project, but we're working on it. Um, I had a video here I was going to show, but I'm thinking that maybe I'll skip over it. it. It's the pitch video for our docu-series. 
but I don't want to run short on time. So, um, <clears throat> as we launch this campaign across the country, we're going to talk, of course, about the health benefits of a plant-based diet. That this is the most powerful medicine available to us is the food that we choose to eat. In fact, I should mention that, you know, I've done a lot of speaking across the country. And, of course, my father's done a ton of speaking. And it never, wherever we go, we hear miraculous stories of healing. I mean, you, you just can't imagine some of the stories that we hear. People who have had a death sentence because of cancer and they've been given a date and time practically as to when they're going to die, who reverse the disease. Type 2 diabetes is almost entirely reversible through a plant-based diet. Uh, neurological problems, autoimmune disorders, it's, it's really incredible. This is a powerful story. But we're also going to talk about the connections between the food that we eat and our environment. The loss of habitat, the loss of forests, the, the water issues, and most of all, the climate problem. And I'm not going to talk right now about climate change, and that's a whole other lecture in and of itself. But what I would like to talk about is the fact that the food that we choose to eat, those food choices, provide the most powerful weapon in our toolkit for addressing this problem of climate change. And most people don't understand this. We are supporting a pioneering study through our nonprofit by a world-leading expert on the connection of climate change to land use. And he has already demonstrated some preliminary or achieved or uh, generated some preliminary results. And here is what he's finding. If the world went plant-based, over a billion hectares of land would be freed from animal agriculture, but nearly 900 million hectares of land would naturally reforest without human intervention. So it would just reforest. 140 gigatons of carbon would be sequestered in those forests over 20 years, both the biomass and the soil. That basically doubles the amount of carbon sequestration that was calculated in a study released earlier this year that generated worldwide attention. Basically, they, they looked at all of the available land around the world for reforestation, and they came up with a similar number. But what they left out was, what if the world went plant-based? And so if that happened, we could double the amount of land available for reforestation. And reforesting all of that land would pull down more than the amount of carbon that has accumulated in the atmosphere since 1750. So this is a, a powerful, powerful story that we're going to be telling as we go across the country. <clears throat> so it's health. It's the environment. But there's one more idea here that I think is really important. I have long believed that the only way that we are going to heal our world is by empowering communities to fix problems. We can't always look to government. We can't look to industry. We have to stop looking up and we have to look down and around ourselves for solutions. Just as I said at the end of our film. It's interesting. You can pick a social problem. Pick any social problem. Go online and research it. You will find a social entrepreneur someplace who has fixed that problem. But the story is always the same. That person or that organization, they're often struggling for money. 
It's very difficult to sustain what they've done, let alone replicate those efforts across the country. And so the metaphor that I like to use is like fireflies in the night. They're beautiful when they light up, but never enough to light up the world. And what we have to do as a society is we've got to figure out how to organize and resource and motivate and educate and form local communities and connect local communities to help make these changes. And so this is what I'm hoping we can demonstrate through our campaign, is how communities can come together to fix one of the most serious problems of our time, which is our health care and also our environmental problems. But there's one big thing in our way here. And it's the apathy that we all feel. We all succumb to this. I succumb to this too sometimes. I just get tired and exhausted. And yes, we have a dog too. And I think sometimes our dog controls us and probably thinks that he's uh, openly superior. But this is a real serious problem. We are overloaded with negativity in our daily lives. We turn on the TV and we hear all this doom and gloom and this dark stuff and we feel powerless to make change. So we've got to overcome this. And not only amongst ourselves but also we have to demand that people who are in positions of power find the courage to make the right decisions. We have to find the courage to act, and we have to demand that people in positions of power find the courage to do what's right. Now I'm gonna just veer off a little bit here, and you probably didn't expect to come to a veg fest and hear this crazy guy talk about something like what I'm getting ready to say here. A lot of times we, think that we have to fix things through a policy or some, some idea. But the root of all of this, and if we don't all understand this, we're never going to be able to fix this world. The root of all of this is how we see ourselves and the world around us and how we fit into that. What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of our life? Now, <clears throat> I was on the web the other day trying to think about what I was going to say for this talk. And I came across this story here, and I, I found it to be really interesting and inspiring to me. So, Christmas Eve, 1968, Apollo 8. It was the first time astronauts had left low Earth orbit, escaped the Earth's gravity, and they went to the moon. And they didn't land on the moon. They circled around the moon, and they ended up coming back to Earth, of course, but they just went up there to circle the moon. So they're on the dark side of the moon. And this was not planned. It wasn't expected. But they're circling the dark side of the moon, they're coming around the other side, and they look out the window, and they see that, and then they see that. And one of the astronauts started saying, hey, get the camera, get the camera, we gotta get this. This was all spontaneous, they just all gasped when they saw this. And then that. And that's one of the most famous photos ever taken. It's referred to as Earthrise. And it's really, a lot of people actually attribute the environmental movement in the 1970s to, to this photo, kind of getting some of that dialogue going. And they said that that changed their lives. It changed how they saw themselves and what they wanted to do. And they actually came up with the term for this because a lot of astronauts feel this. It's called the overview effect. Looking back out and looking back to Earth from space 
And this fella here, Ron Daron, or Darren, I don't know how to pronounce his name, he was maneuvering outside the space station and he looked back and here's what he said. As I approached the top of this arc, it was as if time stood still and I was flooded with both emotion and awareness. Seeing Earth from this vantage point gave me a unique perspective. Part of this is the realization that we are all traveling together on the planet and that if we all looked at the world from that perspective we would see that nothing is impossible. Now I think what they're touching on here is actually something spiritual and when I say spiritual I'm not talking necessarily about religion I'm just talking about seeing the world in a way that's different than what many of us see when we look out at the world. We tend to define ourselves by our attachments, our, our positions of power, our reputations, our, you know, we don't, we don't see things from this perspective. And what I'd like to do here is just, I'm just going to make a series of statements. But I think that in each of these statements you could write a book on, you could have a debate about. But I think that we need to start thinking about these things and we have to go deeper to find the courage to act and to do the right thing. And I really believe each and every one of these statements that the universe is a singular, unitary whole. It's imbued with intelligence. If you see the human body, the human body is incomprehensibly intelligent. That's why it has such incredible self-healing capability. The universe is a cradle for life, unfolding with purpose and direction. We are part of this whole, traveling together. And as such, our lives have purpose and meaning. We are not random events. And we realize that purpose and meaning through connections with others and connection with nature. Living empowered and compassionate lives. And if we understand this, there's nothing that we cannot do. So I think that we really need to go deep and think this way to find the courage to get off the couch, to take actions, to get involved, to do the right thing. And if we do that, we'll be like this lady here. We had a pod meeting last night in Mebbin. This is Wilma Stoy, and she doesn't care if I use her name because we've already done an article on her, and she wants to tell the world what happened. So she discovered the plant-based diet, and she lost nearly 200 pounds. She came into the pod meeting last night and she came through the front door and she tripped and fell and she had a dish of beans in her hand and as she was falling somehow she ca caught the beans the beans never tipped over but she landed flat on the floor face down and we were all concerned because at first she didn't she really didn't move she just kind of laid there and then she slowly but surely got up. And she said after she got up and she was talking about it, she said, you know, I laid there because I'd never had that happen to me and then been able to get up on my own. She didn't think that she could get up. But then she did get up. Why? Because look at her. She lost close to 200 pounds. That dress which is what she brought last night, just to show everyone, is what she used to wear. So this is a woman who has discovered the secret of health. She's full of love and laughter and energy and passion, exuberance. And so what I'd like to see is a world where everyone can feel that, so that maybe the pharmaceutical industry can only they only have one more lifestyle-related drug 
left to them to make, and it's this one here. Oh, let me uh, run, run back here. I'm sorry for the uh, production issues here, so this isn't going to play. Um, this had to come over the internet. Um, <clears throat> so what this was was a, a commercial that someone, it's hilarious. It's, uh, you can look it up on YouTube. It's a commercial for a drug that they refer to it as a depressant. Because we're living in a society where everyone is so exuberant. And how irritating is it to be around people who are always happy? So this is a drug for uh, dampening that down a little bit. So I thought that would be a good way to end my, my talk. But anyways, I'm all done now. I have just a few minutes left. If anyone has any questions, I can take. Uh, I'm happy to answer them. All right, well, thank you for coming out. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, one quick thing. So, she was just asking about our pods, and actually, I meant to say that. The very last screen, um, there's a website there. It's plantpurecommunities.org. And you can go there and you can look up to see where there are pods and join a pod. You can also start a pod. And so, just go to plantpurecommunities.org. I apologize everyone for the technical difficulties. There's no Wi-Fi out in this park if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Alright, next up we have Katya. Are you still there? Katya Gorbacheva. She's a, a vegan bodybuilder. Mike is switching over the presentation, so, so sorry about the noise. Should I go? Yes? Katya, a warm welcome. 